Okay. Uh, today, I, I want to show you that what we have found for um, simply connecting domains in the plane, different from, from the plane itself, this to say that two of them, it, any pair of such uh, domains are in fact bialomorphic, is not true for non simply connected domain in general. And in fact, we will, fi we will find very strict conditions. Okay? So I always start with a simple case we can imagine. So instead of considering uh, simply connected domain, we consider an analogous. We already use the analogous okay? for the Laurent series, for, for the, the, for, which is the natural domain or definition of uh, meromorphic function. Right? Good. So I want to prove the following. So consider two annuli. So for instance, centered at the origin with this is A and this one, and this is A2. Okay, R1, Rj, say, and are, are like this, positive real numbers, right? These are the two annuli. From the point of view of topology, that's obvious, but well, it's better to remember this. Well, I draw them like this, right? From the point of view of topology, uh, you cannot distinguish one from the other, okay? You can deform one into the other, right? So topology doesn't classify, okay? And apparently, this works fine for simply, con no, well, no, not apparently, but for sure, this works fine also for simply connected domains. So you can, you can take very odd domains, but simply connected, different from C, and they are in fact deformed with some function which are not only homeomorphism, but even more, bialomorphism, okay, with the unit disk. So. so what if I try to find a bialomorphism between two annuli? This is the natural question, right? Is it always possible? The answer is no. Um, well, first of all, we consider this simplifi um, simplified version of the, of the statement. So instead, instead of considering R1 and R2 to be two real numbers, positive real numbers, we can always deform one of the, um, both annuli, in such a way that R1 and R2 is equal to 1, right? And the deformation is okay, because it's also a good function from the point of view of complex regularities so there, deformed but not. So we can assume that, okay, without loss of generality, that the two small radii are equal to one, okay? Just to simplify things. Um, and assume that f from a zero one r one into is a biomorphism. All right. So assume that you have this. No, no abstractions in, in terms of topology. Hmm? So, for instance, if I try to, 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 to use the analogs and an analogs with two holes instead of one hole, okay, this cannot be possible, right? Because there are some restrictions given by topology. But here topology doesn't, doesn't tell you any more than saying, okay, you can do this, okay. Uh, we'll see that this will imply something important on the, the two, the two external radii. Okay. All right. We know that f is a holomorphic function and for the holomorphic function, okay, biomorphic, so f is holomorphic function, so with the inverse, which is also holomorphic, the open mapping theorem holds. That is to say, if I take z and and the first annuli, 
in the first annulus. And consider a Z which approaches this boundary here. What you have is that F of Z cannot be internal, right, in this second annulus. It, it has to go to the boundary. So it is either converging to 1 or to R2, right? This is the only possibility. Are you with me? Because otherwise you would, right? All right. So assume that by contradiction, this, this number here, which is a real number, is in between. So it means that as Z approaches the boundary in this way, the points tends, F of Z tends to an inner point. Now this would be, okay, a value which is a neighborhood, right? Remember that F is biolomorphic. So that also the image of F minus 1 should be, right? So this point, which is a boundary point, becomes an inner point, which cannot be. I'm assuming that F is a biomorphism, right? As I said, it's allomorphic and bio, right? So it can only be that this number is either 1 so, or R2, because this is the, the boundary of uh, the second annulus, right? So <coughs> it's not, uh, okay, this time I have to write one here. Without restriction, I can assume that f of z actually tends to 1 as z tends to 1. Because otherwise, I would take f tilde of z to be r2 over f of z, right? So, I, I made some uh, simplified, uh, simplifi simplifying uh, assumption that is to say that the first two radii are equal to 1 and then because of this, I can also assume that this is the case, right? Otherwise, I should consider F tilde instead of F. Yeah. Might consider, right? So, also, this function is well defined. You see that because this is not zero, well defined, it is, of course, a biomorphic as it is f. So we can use this notation that f is a biomorphic from a 1, 0, 1, r1 into a 2, 0, 1, r2, such that f of z tends to 1 as z modulus tends to 1, okay? And then we define a function u of z, u, sorry, yes, u of z to be a logarithm of modulus of f of z minus m, m is a constant number, logarithm of modulus of z. So, this logarithm, logarithm is the real logarithm because this is a real number, m is a real number, so that is to say u is a function from a1 into r, okay? This is just a new function I'm considering. Uh, and we have, well, well, actually, without saying anything, I might, I have to say that m defines here for any choice of m another function so that we have here an infinite family of functions like this. Okay, observation. U is well defined and for any m this is true, right? No problem because this number here is never zero and this number here is never zero. Right? 
Um, furthermore, since uh, well, this is the case, then you are, com you are composing something which is never vanishing. Okay, so you can write it also this way if you wish. One half logarithm of f of z times f of z bar, which represent the modulus of f of z squared, right? So I put one half here because, because of the, the square, right? So the rules huh, uh, for logarithm works fine. And if I write this way, you notice that the function u, whatever m is, is in fact the c infinity function when considered as a function from R2 into, into R. Hmm? So the components are same. You cannot say that this is holomorphic because, because it is real value function, right? <laughs> and we already said that, well, if the imaginary part is zero, so the, the function has to be constant, this function is not supposed to be constant, right? This is a biomorphism. Huh? Good. So now, the question is, how, kind, uh, how can I describe some properties? Well, I can use uh, one of the, in one of the first exercises, I ask you to prove that the Laplacian, the real Laplacian, is associated to the Cauchy operators, right? And so I want to calculate Yes, which is up to a constant, the Laplacian of u. This is four times, right? If I'm not mistaken with a constant. In any, in any case, this is a constant times the Laplacian. So if I calculate this, and remember that the u of z was defined as uh, one half logarithm of f of z times f of z bar minus m over 2 logarithm of z times z bar. Well, since the functions involved here are all analytic, okay, in particular are the function u is c infinity, but the derivatives are continuous, so that I can also apply Schwarz's Schwarz, uh, theorem, right? So they can invert the, the order of derivation. So in particular, when I calculate this, sorry, all right. Either you write this way or you write this way, right? That's what I wanted to say. Yes, sure. It's a second, uh, second order uh, differential operator, right? So I, what I mean is differentiate first with respect to z bar, then with respect to z, but you can, of course, exchange also the order of, of the differentiation. Hmm? So I try to be, I try to follow this rule. So first differentiate with respect to z bar, and then with respect to z. So this is one half the logarithm of f of z which becomes d over dc and ha here I have when 1 over 2 f of z f of z bar right because I'm different I'm, I'm using the the chain rule right so this is and then I have to differentiate this with respect to z bar, which apparently is a product of functions. Okay, so I should imagine that I have to use the Leibniz rule. But d of the z bar of f of z is zero because f is holomorphic. So the only part which remains here is f of z times. Okay? And similar here, I have minus m over 2. Okay, this and times z. Correct? 
So z and z cancels because it's not zero. F on z and f on z cancel because it's not zero. And then I apply the other derivation and have this is uh, sorry, yes, d over dz of what of one over two f c bar d over dz bar f bar z minus m over two d over d c bar one over z bar. Sorry, this is not z, which means that this is zero. Obviously, right? Because this function here is anti-holomorphic, which means okay. And here I can use the fact that well, I have this is a product of two functions, right? I have the derivative of this, which is zero for the same reasons, right? So I have the this is the times because this is anti holomorphic and this means that the derivative with respect to z of an anti holomorphic function is zero. So this is zero. Okay? And plus then I have one over two f of z bar and then I have the derivative of z derivative of z bar f of z and this is already zero right whatever m is f of z bar is sure sure right so this is not zero in principle this no this is not zero this is the the, the derivative the antiderivative okay of this anti holomorphic function but since I have th these two operators here, all right, and I can exchange the order of differentiation, I can also say that this is 1 over 2 f, but this, since this is 0 of d over dz bar, d over dz f bar z. And this is 0 because this, as, a, as I said before, this is anti holomorphic and this is. The, the bar operator, the, the operator. This is the bar. So this is zero. So it means that u is harmonic. U is harmonic. So conclusion is okay. This is that is the u is zero, and this is true for any m, right? Okay, so I have the this function here. Is harmonic. And furthermore, as z tends to the unit uh, circle, that is to say when the z has modules which tends to 1, here we have that this is the modulus, right, so the square over 2, sorry, right, that is to say this tends to 0 and this tends to 0 again because we are assuming that modulus of f of z tends to 1 as z tends to 1. <laughs> this implies the following, that is to say u of z tends to 0 without any assumption on m. Now, as z tends to, in modulus to R1, that is to say if z tends to the boundary of the first annulus, but not the, 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 the interior, but so not the, in, the smaller, but the larger radius, what happens? Well we have that this number here becomes, well, we have that this becomes log of R1 squared, right? 1 over 2, and then I have a hem here. 
because z, this is modulus of z square, right? You can write it also logarithm of r1 because this is the square root, right? And here I have similarly that this tends to one half logarithm of r2 squared. As we noticed, since it is a biomorphism, it cannot tend to 1, right? R1, right? And so I take m, since I have the freedom of choosing m whatever I want, m to be logarithm, let me check if it is correct, of r2 over logarithm of r1. Uh, with this choice, okay, up to now, all the conclusions are true for any m, but then I take this m. This is a real number, right? And this real number makes the following, that u of z tends to 0 as z tends to either 1 or r1. So we have a annulus, a 1, a function u, u in uh, uh, defined in, uh, in the annulus, which is there, harmonic. And the values on the boundary is 0. Okay, so how is this, how does it look as a harmonic function with boundary values equal to 0? this constant equal to zero. Because for harmonic functions, I think that the harmonic function has the real, for t take for instance, this as a consequence of the fact that the real imaginary part of a holomorphic function are in fact harmonic, right? Then you can show that given a harmonic function, this is related to holomorphic and anti-holomorphic. But what we have is that we have a maximum principle for holomorphic functions, right? Right? Can you change the just look at the Okay. I so, up to now, we have just a, uh, a function u which is harmonic in the analogs. And for any m, it turns out that as z approaches the unit circle, so it is the smaller, uh, the, the, the inner boundary, okay, if there's any meaning, okay, we obtain that, since we have assumed that f of z tends to 1 as well in modulus, then u of z tends to 0. But in the beginning you said when z approached to 1, so f of z approached to 1 or r2. No, no, I, what I said is, okay, probably I, I, I didn't say, okay. These are the two possibilities. But if, if the second case occurs, as I said, I can always take f tilde to be this function here, which is also a biomorphism and in such a way that this is true. So I'm assuming this. Since it is a biomorphism, well, I didn't say it explicitly, but maybe it's, well, thank you for the question. So now I'm taking, without loss of generality, a biomorphism from one annulus to the other with the property, well, the two annuli have the, the, the smaller radius equal to one. And as z tends to one, in modulus, okay, so it tends to the unit circle in the first annulus, f of z tends to the unit circle in the second annulus, okay? This is the assumption which is without uh, losing generality in, in, uh, in our consideration. And I then con constructed here a function u which turns out to be harmonic with this parameter here. So I have a family of function and since this is the assumption I, I made, I also say that u of z tends to 0 as z tends to 1 in modulus. When z tends to r1, f of z in modulus cannot tend to 1 because it is a biomorphism, right? So it has to tend to the other boundary. That is to say modulus of f of z tends to r2. That is u of z tends to this. Since m here is uh, not chosen up to now, and for a suitable choice, that is, if m is this real number, it turns out that u z tends to 0 as z tends to 1 and as z tends to r1. So the boundary value, the boundary value of 
the harmonic function is zero. But the maximum principle applies also for harmonic function. Okay? So if a maximum is taken of the modulus, it has to be taken on the boundary. So it is that the function is constantly equal to zero. With this choice of n. Okay? So let me probably write it down in another slide. So fine. Maximum modulus principle applies to U since it is harmonic. This is because in general it, it, it is true for any harmonic function. But in our case it is even easier because, well, the maximum modulus gives, well, this function here is monotone, right? Since R1 and R2 and are greater than 1, right? What I'm saying here is that the, ma the maximum of this number here depends on the maximum of these two functions, right? And these two functions are, are not harmonic, but they are holomorphic, so they have to be on the boundary. Good. So maximum modulus, uh, uh, maximum modulus principle applies also to u, and u of z is 0 as z tends to 1 and z tends to r1. So we have the annulus, u is defined here, it's harmonic, and the values on the boundaries, so the boundaries of the annulus is the pair of, of circles. On this, band, on this boundary, the function u it takes value 0, or tends to the value 0, right? That is to say, the function u is constant. With the choice of m that I made in this, because this is not true in general, but with this suitable choice, I obtain the second fact. Hmm? The first fact is independent on m, which is harmonic and okay. Now, But if u is constantly equal to 0, I have that logarithm of f of z minus m, a logarithm, is 0. OK? Or I have that the logarithm of modulus of f of z is m a logarithm of modulus of z, and this is true for any z, which can be also written as logarithm of modulus of z to the power m. Correct? But the logarithm is the standard logarithm. No tricks up to now. So the, the standard logarithm is, as I said, monotone, right? So it is invertible. And then we can say that from this, it follows that modulus of f of z is modulus of z to the power m. Because this is the real logarithm. I didn't put r. But it is obvious this, this number here is a real number. So if you want, it's the restriction on the reals, OK? The, of a complex logarithm. So no problem of determina determination of uh, the principal argument and so on. All right. Now, we take number six. Now we take in the analogs. Well, the analogs is not, is not simply connected, obviously, OK? Step zero. I didn't say it, but. But I can always take, say, a disk, which
which is simply connected, say disk D, while contained in the annulus. Correct? Well, I can, have, I can take this disk, many disks. Okay. As soon as I take a disk, the disk is a simply connected uh, subset of C, and it in, it never well it has to be simply connected, right? So it cannot uh, go around the zero. It can be def so we can take also something say not as a disk, something odd, but biomorphic to a disk. No problem. So what you cannot have, want to have is another annulus around here, right? So that on this domain D is simply connected, well contained, okay? Or even something weird like this. But simply connected. In any simply connected domain, I can define the logarithm. Remember, this was a lemma which I proved several weeks ago. Okay, you have a simply connected domain, you have a function defined on it, which never vanishes. Then you can define a function g such that x of g of x is the function, and then it is also uniquely determined as, as soon as you fix the, the, the one value, right? And the determination is unique, which is important. Then I define, if it is simply connected, and you see, and define define uh, a logarithm, complex logarithm, of course, and D. Okay, this can be done. Okay, such that since f of z is not zero for any z in this domain d, and even in, in the entire and the entire annulus, we can write f of z to be exp of g of z. Okay, this is in fact the lemma. Because D is simply connected. Good. But now I have that modulus of f of z is modulus of z to the power m. Right? This is also the modulus of EGZ. Okay, I write it also this way. The exponential is the complex exponential, of course. And from this, I also have that modulus of z is the modulus of e g z over m. Remember that m was a real number, and it was determined as a, the ratio of the two logarithms, logarithm of r2 and logarithm of r1. It was chosen properly in order to have uh, vanishing uh, the boundary on the second boundary. Okay. Good. Now I define this function g of z, capital G of z, to be e g of z of m over z. Right. So this is holomorphic. In D. Why? Well, because this function g is holomorphic in D. It is defined in the simply connected domain. Z is a holomorphic function. We have a ratio of two holomorphic functions and the second one, so the denominator never vanishes in D for sure. Right? So we have no singularities. Holomorphic function. Good. Furthermore, I have that modulus of g of z because it is chosen in this way, is 1. And this is true for any C. Okay. 
Now, this means that the function is what? Okay, G is a holomorphic function okay, in a simply connected domain and the modulus of G of Z is constant equal to 1. How can I? Well, this is one of the exercises I left you. Okay, in one of the if the modulus is constant, then the function is constant itself. You can see it in several ways. Not, not because this is the exponential function. Okay, in general, assume that you have a holomorphic function in a domain, and assume that you know that the modulus of this function turns out to be constant then necessarily the function is constant. How can you say this? Well, in several ways, but a simple way is that, well, we have the maximum principle for G, right? So this is true not for the points on the boundary, but for, for any point. It means that any point inside is a maximum for modulus of the function, right? So it is constant. Another point is that, well, you have, well, this is related to the open open uh, mapping theorem, right? Cannot be unless the function is, is constant that the modulus is uh, reduces to a point, right? To, it has to reduce to a to an open set of a two, right? <laughs> Correct? So in any case, what I, I obtain from here is that G is is lambda. G is constant constant because of maximum modulus max say maximum max modulus theorem right then I have these are stupid inequalities as I said but they are they have a G of Z is lambda right Remember that G of Z was defined to be E G Z over M over Z, which means that E G Z over M is lambda Z. Correct? Z is not zero, so I can multiply and or divide everything. Now I take the, the derivative. on both sides, right? And I obtained that this is E G of Z over M times G prime of Z over M. Yeah? On the right hand side I have lambda. But lambda is what? This. E G of Z over M over Z. That is to say that G prime of Z is M over Z. I don't know anything about G, but G prime of Z is M over Z. So I have the derivative of functions, right? Very well. Now, what is G, uh, this, uh, this number here? If I consider F prime of Z, over f of z well remember that this g um, sorry e g of z is f of z right and this comes in here we have defined g z to be in some sense the logarithm of f right and then we obtain from this uh, equality is that G prime of Z is M over Z. M is the fixed M we uh, will we have chosen. Huh? So now F prime of Z is, well, the derivative of this over F of Z, right? Which is G prime of Z, right? Times A of G Z. So it is M over Z. All right, and 
I take this, the integral of this number here over a close one, one over 2 pi i, of course, I always forget this. One, uh, one over 2 pi i times the integral of f prime over f. And the integral is along a curve, say a, a circle. This number here is in between, right? Between 1 and R1, right? What is this? This is the, well, this argument principle, okay, but what, um, what number is this? <laughs> is the index of, well, if you call this cu curve gamma, this circle gamma of, of uh, 1 over z, with respect to curve gamma, capital gamma, which is f composed to gamma, right? Index of which point? Of zero. And zero is inside, okay. So this number is one, right? Is it okay for you? Because this is, well, I can translate, okay, call this curve gamma. Okay, this is a circle. This is the integral up to a constant, which I always forget of the curve gamma, which is f composed gamma, of 1 over z, which represents the numbers of times, so the index with respect to gamma, capital gamma, of 0, which is 1. No, it is one. This is independent of, this is a problem of saying how many times the curve gamma? One time. Well, on the other hand, on the other hand, that's, that's correct. That's correct. This is the integral, well, you just forget this, okay? <laughs> and look at this on the left hand side. We are just computing the index of a point with respect to a curve. And this number is 1. On the other side, this is m over z, dz, 1 over 2 pi i is in front of the same gamma, right? And this number is m. Right? So m has to be 1. But m was the logarithm of r2 over logarithm of r1. That is to say, R2. So if the biomorphisms exist after this long excursion in harmonic analysis, and uh, well, it is not, it's not because I wanted to make this, uh, this proof so long. It's, there is no other way. Huh? <laughs> so the, the consequence is, is that the two, um, um, if you assume that R1 is equal to R2 is equal to 1, also the capital R's, so the two radii, the big radii, are the same. So in general, what you preserve is the ratio, R1 to over R, so the, the smaller over the, 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 the bigger, right? So it is very rigid, the request to be to annuli with the same, well, to, with, with the biomorphism, okay? It's not true that you take two, two annuli and say, well, one is somehow related to the other quite easily, okay? So the conclusion is that R2 is equal to R1 when R1 is equal to R2, and it is equal, the, 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 the not capital ones, okay, are equal to 1, right? And I think that with this, We have seen that the, the tools we have are very, very powerful in some sense, okay?
Now, for the second part of uh, uh, today's lessons, I, I want to go back to the notion of univalent functions, and I will use these slides if they work. Is it gone? No. Okay. Okay. So let. Oh. Okay, I do it like this. So let S be the class of holomorphic functions injective in the unit disks, but with this extra assumption so that A naught in the power expansion is zero and A1, the first coefficient in the power expansion, is equal to one. You can always reduce this case. Because, well, otherwise, you can subtract a naught and divide what you have by a suitable constant, right? In order to have this, what you know by mm, that the uh, hypothesis of uh, injectivity of the function guarantees that f prime at zero is different from zero, so that you can divide. Okay. So after, so this means that you are translating the image keeping zero fixed and rotating in such a way that the derivative and dilating if you need so it is multiplying by a complex number in such a way that f prime of zero is equal to one so this is the class s this is normally called class s because in the literature in german this was called the schlicht functions class schlicht funktionen schlicht means smooth and of course, there is a notion relate uh, another class of functions, and the functions are like this, okay? And the, the class of function is indicated by sigma. This is a function defined on the complement of the unit disk. As you can see, one over z, one over z, z squared, and so on and so forth appears in the Laurent expansion. It is defined on the in a neighborhood of infinity if you want and the functions are supposed to be um, injective in the complement of the unit disk and you can see that if you look the half hemisphere in the Riemann sphere which is outside in projection or in this, okay so you take the upper instead of the lower hemisphere you are taking what what is outside the unit disk right Remember that we projected from the North Pole each point of the sphere to the plane, except for the North Pole, which was sent to infinity. The upper hemisphere went to the plane without the circle and the disk. And the lower hemisphere was mapped into the disk. So you are considering this function. And if you um, take the inversion, which is what you have to do, I want to see this, uh, the, the singularity of this function in, in zero. You see that in zero, the function, the, the conjugative function has a pole and its residue as written here is equal to one. So at infinity, this meromorphic function has, um, has residue one. So the choice of the coefficient, so in the principal part, so it is reversed, okay? If, you're, if you are working in the complement of the disk, what is normal is to have z over z minus, uh, z to the power minus one minus three, so on and so forth. So what is the singular part, so the principal part is given by z. Okay, and then you can also reduce to the case such that g of z is different from zero for any z in the complement of the unit disk because, well, this is not a big problem. If by chance you have the image, it's an open set, right? In the plane, you can translate everything in such a way that the origin is not, is not uh, contained in the image. But this, is just, this adjustment doesn't change the nature of the function g because the function still remains uh, injective and holomorphic. Just add a translation, okay? Uh, 
Um, what is also interesting is that when you start from a fu function in the class S, it is Schlicht, and you consider what is natural to do when considering what is inside, outside. So you take 1 over z, which maps the outside, inside, and take the function f, and then take, again, 1 over, right? So inversion over the inversion of huh, the function. You obtain the power expansion, which is like this. Make some calculations. It's not very long, very difficult. And this class, this g, belongs to sigma prime. So it is holomorphic with a singularity at infinity of residue 1, and it doesn't vanish. And what is also nice to know is that when you consider this transformation, which is uh, not natural in terms of uh, projection, so, uh, stereographical projection, but it is natural in terms of uh, power series expansion. So you take the function g and sigma 1 and compute that z squared. And then you take the square root of this because of the properties of the power expansions, as I said, the pioneers in the study of uh, complex, function, complex value functions were very experts in uh, power series. So g of z has this expansion, which turns out to be good in terms of uh, preservation of the, the of, of remaining, say, in the same class, right? Because this z multiplies 1 and something else. And this something else is, is good. It's like the g of z. Good. Now, don't be worried about the, the, the notation. What is surprising is that if you consider a, a univalent function on the complement of the unit disk, okay, then the coefficients, the moduli of the coefficients of the power expansion, the Laurent expansion, are satisfy this, this very important theorem. So the, the sum of all moduli of coefficient times n, where n is the index, is smaller or equal to 1. And this is known as uh, area theorem. And it, it has also some geometric motivation I cannot get into now. But assume that we have this simple case, okay, that the first coefficient is equal to 1 in modulus, right? So in this case, it means that the others are, the, all the others have to die, because otherwise there, are, there is a contribution which fails to, to guarantee this, uh, this estimate. So the function reduces to this, OK? B0 and B1. B1 is modulus 1. And the z is the principal part, right? So in the, in the general power expansion I showed you here, what is it? Here, B2, Bn, they all die. Ah, yes. Thank you. So B, B0 and B1 survive if modulus of B1 is equal to 1. B0 is, cannot be controlled by area theorem because there is a 0 in front of it. Okay, But if B1 has modulus 1, B2 and Bn, all the Bn's from 2 to infinity die, so they vanish. So the function is like this. And this function is a conformal mapping of the complement of the unit disk onto the complement of, of a line segment of length 4. In some sense, it's like if you consider, but topologically, this means that, well, if you consider an, an infinite annulus, well, this function maps injectively what is the infinite annulus, right, with R1 R infinite, into the plane minus a slit of length 4. Okay, and the calculations are here if you want to check. So you take the boundary, and the boundary is mapped into the boundary. You can see that this distance here it depends on a real cosine, and a 2 is in front. So this gives you a direction, and cosine has possibility to go to 
plus 1 to minus 1, so that it covers a, a, a segment of length 4. And this number 4 will come out in several other statements. Now, Sorry, I see here you are increasing by 2. 0, you see just a slide. Pardon me? You want, you want to, uh, to, to tell me that I have to do this, right? Yeah, sure. So this, yeah, thank you. And that, without rolling the, 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 the slides, it's better, yes. Okay, this is the, the stupid calculation, okay? But it is important. So this is the, the theorem uh, which uh, probably is considered the, the birth of <coughs> geometric, uh, geometric uh, function theory for this class of functions. Uh, because Bieber back a century ago, almost a century ago, well said, well, if you have the power expansion and I can prove that the second coefficient is necessarily smaller in modules, smaller or equal to two. And there is an, an extremal function for these estimates. And it, it is known as the Kebe function. In fact, this very simple function, you see, this is well defined in the unit disk. It is injective in the unit disk. It is in the class S because at zero takes the value zero. And at, at uh, zero, the derivative is equal to one. Well, if you, if you write a power expansion, it's exactly this. So the a n is n. So you cannot improve this for the case of the Kube. And what Bieberbach conjecture is that, well, in general, the nth coefficient is in modulus more or equal to n. And it took a long time. Well, first, let us see how, how this can be proved. Now, now it is easy to see. Uh, this is true. <laughs> now it is easy, but for a long time it was considered a very difficult result to obtain. So you apply one of the, the, the transformation formula that I have, then g of z is in fact like this, right? Use the, 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 the square transformation, and g is in sigma, as I said, okay? So that, well, for instance, from the area theorem, a2 over 2, which is the second coefficient, is smaller or equal to 1, so actually more. I can say the sum of all the coefficient times n, each a n times modulus of a n is smaller or equal to 1. So in particular, this is true and this is obvious. You see, this is one line proof, but it required a lot of calculations in the past. Well, if equality occurs, then we have something related to the previous example, then, well, equality occurs when we have this, and this is one of the cases we have already encountered. So it is essentially the, remember, the, the function which maps the complement of the unit disk into a, uh, the complement of, of a segment of length four. And you make this, well, substitution. You go back, make the substitution, you obtain it. This is up to a rotation, the KB transformation. And this, conjugation, say, you first rotate, consider k, and then re-rotate the opposite direction, in the opposite, of the, an opposite angle, doesn't, doesn't make any influence in the modulus of the coefficients. Kebe is, uh, the name of Kebe is related also to this fact, which is quite surprising to me. Uh, you have the map in the class with some regular analytic conditions. It is defined in the unit disk, holomorphic and injective. Well, you can also say, well, it is normalized, good. Well, for sure, the image contains this disk. You cannot avoid to have this disk in the image. The entire disk. which is surprising. And, well, this can be, can be seen the following way. And assume that omega is an omitted value by f. Take this function here. This is, by definition, another function which is still in z. And this is the power expansion. And then you obtain from the previous calculation that this is smaller or equal to 2, the first coefficient, right? But since a2 is smaller or equal to 2, then we have that 
modulus of w cannot be smaller than 1 over 4. So that's why it's called one quarter theorem. And well, apparently, in, in this calculation, you are using just the fact that this is the power expansion related to this function, and f as a power expansion like z plus a 2z square plus a so on and so forth. So, one might wonder if um, univalency can be avoided, and can, it cannot. If you take this class of functions here, and this sequence of functions here, they are all in S, sorry, they are all normalized. But f n omits this value. These are not injective because e n z is not injective, right? The Kebbe functions, which have this also this uh, uh, representation, say, and here you should recognize something which relates the disk to the right half plane, right? Yesterday I called this transformation z, which the function which maps z into 1 plus z over 1 minus z is called the Kelly transformation. So, we have 1 quarter, so w squared minus 1 quarter. So, the 1 quarter is c and in fact, the Kebe, Kebe function is the map which, map which maps the unit disk t onto the entire complex plane minus an infinite half line starting from minus uh, 1, 4 minus infinity to minus one four. So it is extremely also in this sense because it contains the disk of radius one four. So this since this function is in the in, in S, you cannot uh, hope to have a larger disk contained in the in the range of any function. I'm sorry. Well, there are other results concerning the estimates of the derivative of a function in S. And this is known as Kebbe distortion theorem, which relates the value of the modulus of f prime in terms of r, where r is the modulus of z when the z is in the disk. This is the growth theorem, and this is, well, an estimate, an estimate of the which of something which is related to this and to this. Well, as, you, as usual, uh, Kebe, the Kebe function uh, is the, uh, the function which uh, realizes the, the equality in this uh, estimates. So, Bivera conjecture is the following way. So, assume that you have a function and uh, in the class S then a n in modulus is more equal to n for n n and strict equality occurs if f is a rotation of the Kebe, of the Kebe function. Uh, the techniques involved in, in the first attempts to prove these conjectures and some of, some of the, the experts consider this conjecture fake, false. So, they try to find a counterexample <laughs> for a long time. So, it was finally proved only mid-80s by the branch, but using another theory, so the Leibniz chain theory, which is also interesting, but I cannot get in. Um, um, let me just give you some overview of, of the class of function which I've been studying, because as usual, for the general case, if the general case is difficult, what you, you can do is that, well, maybe for some, for some simple cases, so for some restricted classes, I can, have, uh, I can have some partial results. So, for instance, it was proved almost immediately if the coefficients are all real, then the conjecture was true. Then there were some estimates by little, by others. In some other cases, some, some uh, power expansion which uh, have only in, uh, coefficient in the, I don't remember, probably in the odd, in the odd, uh, for, for odd, for odd uh, indices, it was proved for, so, so for some classes. And in the meanwhile, there were, this, this classes gave other, other important uh, results. So in particular, uh, the class uh, of functions um, with good ranges have been studied. So in particular, uh, I remember you, I, re I recall you that the star-like domain is a domain with the property that you take a point 
and uh, well, with respect to a point sorry means that w whenever you have any point in in this in this set the entire segment uh, connecting the point to the entire real segment okay is in e right so it is called star like because you can assume to have an odd boundary but refer to one center right and convexity is something which is more familiar probably to you I mean it means star likeness for any point in some sense so you take two pair of points in a set then necessarily the segment connecting the two points is in the set but we have examples of function of sorry of uh, sets which are star like but not convex right do you have an example well very easy take something with a take a, a pardon me take uh, take a star okay It is not convex. If you take two points in the, in the, in near the vertices of the star, okay, in, in, into near the vertices of separate, separate, uh, vert, near the se separate vertices, then it cannot be connected by a segment, but the star is star like with, res with respect to the center of the star, right? So this is a geometric definition, okay, which apparently doesn't have anything to do. Well, a function is called convex in this in this setting if it is holomorphic, univalent, so it is in S, and if the image of the disk is a convex set. And similarly, it is called star-like if f of d is star-like. Well, with respect to uh, to the origin, because the origin is certainly in the range, right? So there are functions which are starlight, but which are not convex. And the simple example is the KB function. The KB function maps the unit disk into the plane with an infinite half line removed with a slit, which turns out to be starlight, but not convex, of course, right? So the class of this the class of uh, functions uh, which are convex are denote, is denoted by C and the class of star-like because S is already used is S and a star. Is a, this is a standard notation okay, in many books, even in the box book, in old books. As, as I said, this is obvious. So S star is in S and convex is in S star. And the Kippe function, as I said, is an example of a star-like but not convex function, right? So, the idea in this sh very short overview is to, to show how we can prove the, no, we can prove, it has been proved by, by the expert of that time that the Biva conjecture works fine. So, it is, became a, a theorem for these classes of functions in particular. Okay? So, related to the classes C and, and uh, S star, so convex and star-like function, is the class P. This is also, also uh, a standard notation. Functions which have the property that they map the unit disk into the half plane, right half plane. So, uh, yesterday I gave you an example of biomorphism of the unit disk into the right half plane. So, for sure it is a function probably up to a constant which is in the class P. This class P is called the class, uh, the class of Caratodori functions. It's just a name, okay? And we, regularize, we normalize this function in such a way that phi of zero is one. If you remember, yesterday in the Curry transformation we had z mapped into one plus z over one minus z and zero is mapped into one. So it is one example. And in fact, <laughs> Caratodori gave us 
important uh, result. Well, since phi of 0 is 1, it means that in the power expansion, this first term is 1, right? Then we consider the power expansion for n greater or equal to 1, and these are the coefficients. So the, the estimate of the coefficient is like this. It's uniform for the class P. It's equal to 2 for n, and the equality is sharp for each n. And this is how they, the, 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 uh, just I wanted to, to, to show you how, the, how the, the techniques we have so far introduced can be applied. So you take f, the, the function phi, and you multiply times this auxiliary function, right? And the integrate of the circle. So this integral turns out to give you, well, this something which dies because it is holomorphic and something which doesn't. So this is an integral which depends on n, right? Because n here is changes, right? Um, so by the residue theorem, we have that i n, I should have written i n, is 2 minus a n, which, well, you can also say, well, this is the real part of E, and this is what you can calculate, right? the real part of this part. Because here, you actually considered something related to complex trigonometric functions. Um, from this, they have that, well, this number here is positive, and it follows that this number is the real number, 2 minus a n, the real part, sorry, is greater or equal to 0, so that is the real part of a n is smaller or equal to 2, and this is valid for any n. This is an application of, not, not stupid application of, of the residue theorem, if you want, right? So this, is a, this becomes a tool more than, in fact, calculate this integral. This becomes a tool. And it is well, well, um, well applied. And actually, as I, as I told you, this is an example of a function, the Kelly transformation in the class P, and if you write the power expansion, remember that we had it somehow in different versions, but if you write this down, now all the coefficient from A2 to A infinity <laughs> are equal to 2. I'm sorry, what's going on? Well, there is something missing here. Well, <laughs> I'm sorry for this. Well, I think that we can stop here and continue with uh, the next slides uh, next time. I don't know what happened, but uh, in any case, the idea is that you can better characterize. Maybe it's like this, right? No. I'm sorry. So, you can say that a function is in class a star if something else is in class P, for instance, okay? You can characterize the the classes using s these three sets s star c and p okay uh, we'll see you we'll see tomorrow how it it goes on okay tomorrow morning right we have classes um i stop here <laughs>